We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. There's a heresy called Calvinism. And Calvinists, they believe one of the doctrines which is called limited atonement. Limited atonement. Limited atonement, what that basically is, is that Christ did not die for everyone in the world. Christ only died for the elect. So if you're a saved Christian today, you know who Jesus Christ died for? Calvinists teach Jesus only died for you saved Christians. He didn't die for the atheist, the homosexual, the Muslim, and Catholics. It's only our group. So that's why it's limited atonement. See that? Jesus' Jesus's atonement is limited to only the saved elect. The reason why this is their basis of argument, this is their rationalization. Their rationalization is because Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his atonement, is pure salvation, correct? It saves to the uttermost, right? Here's a question. If Jesus' atonement is for the whole world, okay, he already died for the whole world, right? So he saved the whole world, right? But the problem is this. The whole world obviously is not saved. Only the elect, the saved Christians are saved. So it shows right here that when Jesus' atonement, if we argue his atonement was for the whole world, then we're saying that his atonement power is powerless. See that? That's what they're accusing us of. So I'll put it right here. They're accusing us that we're making it powerless because if his atonement is for the whole world, why did it only save us Christians? Not everybody. That's their argument. So thus his atonement is powerless if you're going against Calvinism. But if you're a Calvinist, you can argue his atonement is truly powerful because, and it gives true, pure salvation to the elect. Because look, all of us are saved. We're going to heaven. So thus the atonement, the salvation is only for the elect, but not for the whole world. That's their argument. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. So this seems to be Judas's white favorite argument. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. See, that sacrifice for sins is permanent. Permanent. Not halfway, not partially. It should be done, complete, forever. Sat down on the right hand of God. And notice that this sacrifice will actually redeem. Look at chapter 9 and verse 12. Chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained what? Eternal redemption for us. See that? This redemption, uh, this sacrifice he did actually redeems. It actually saves people. Let's also look at chapter 7, verse 23. Chapter 7 and verse 23. And they... Uh, I'll give you some time to look over there. I'm going to write the verses right here. So here are the Calvinist verses. They also use chapter 9, verse 12, and they also use chapter 7 and verse 23 through 25. Let's keep reading right here. Verse 23. And they truly were many priests, but they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, Jesus Christ, because he continueth forever, continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So notice right here, Jesus Christ, he is actually interceding. Not only that, this literally saved people too. Look at Luke 19. Luke 19. It actually, past tense, past tense saved people. So when there are Christian apologists who try to debunk Calvinism, well, it does provide redemption and intercession, but you don't get saved until you actually receive it. No, when Jesus Christ gave that sacrifice that provided redemption and intercession, it already saved. It already saved, because this is their argument. Look at Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to what? Save that which was lost. 
Didn't he already come to save the lost? Yes, he already did that. Thus, past tense, saved. He already saved them. Now let's look at chapter 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. So his sacrifice already saved people. His sacrifice already saved people. So when we argue that his sacrifice was for the whole world, then the whole world should be past tense saved. Obviously, that's not true. The whole world is already not saved. So thus, we have to argue that what he already saved was the elect, the elect. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world. See, past tense, Jesus came already to what? Save sinners of whom I am chief. See that? Jesus already came with his sacrifice to save sinners. If you say he sacrificed for the whole world, then the whole world should be already saved. That's how the Calvinists argue. But obviously the whole world's not saved, so thus it must be a limited sacrifice, a limited salvation, limited atonement, only for the elect that are already saved. But there are flaws to this argument. Not only that, Judas White, excuse me, a.k.a. James White, he also argues this way to make it sound really serious. He says that since Christ's offering already saved people back in the past, universal atonement will not make any sense since Christ's past offering saved everyone. But, you know, when you say universal atonement says Christ's offering saved everyone, that doesn't make sense because many are still going to hell. You're going to give the blasphemy if you don't believe in limited atonement to say Christ currently right now is interceding for the sins of the damn people in hell. That's what he's arguing. Because since Christ's sacrifice is, has already saved and is already interceding, it should be a limited people save people. But if you say the whole world, then you're saying Christ's sacrifice is for the whole world saving and interceding on their behalf. That's blasphemy, James White proposes. Because people burning in hell, you're saying they're being interceded by Christ. But... The, there's a simple argument against this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. You know how we can argue? We can argue this. Christ, Christ's offering did save. It did save everyone. But here's the thing. Even though his offering did save everyone, it cannot function and operate until you apply it to yourself. That's the thing. So Christ's offering did save everyone, but it cannot operate until you apply it to yourself. Now you might say that doesn't make sense. No, it does, even with common sense examples. For example, let's say I offered, I offered my offering a sufficient supply of food for a starving village. If I did that, that means my offering saved everyone from starvation, yes? Yes, but here's the thing. It does not operate on that person until he applies the food in his mouth. And when he applies the food in his mouth, then you can say that the offering starts operating now. That offering of food starts operating on him now. That's the same thing with Christ's sacrifice. Because look at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19. Look how this works. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the who? World unto himself. So look at this. The Bible recognizes God saved. God reconciled the whole world. But even though he reconciled and saved the whole world, you can only receive that when, it's, when you apply it to yourself. It has to be applied. Look at this. Keep reading not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, we pray you in Christ said, be ye what? 
reconciled to God. Look at that. Paul recognized you got to apply it to yourself. So in verse 19, Paul recognized this salvation, this reconciliation from Christ's offering did save everyone, did reconcile the whole world. But now in verse 20, Paul saying, please apply it to yourself. Let's also now look at John chapter 3, verse 17. John chapter 3, verse 17. John chapter 3, verse 17. Look, I did my job of saving somebody if I throw in a, if I throw in a light raft to you. If I, if I sh uh, throw in some sort of light raft or something for you, some lifesaver, I did my job of saving you. Now it's up to you to apply it to yourself, all right? Put it on yourself. Duh, that's just a common sense example. Now look at the book of John chapter 3 and verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the who? World through him might be what? Saved. See, the whole world saved, but even though God saves the whole world, it's you have to apply it now. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at that, verse 18. Now you got to apply it now. You got to apply it by believing on Jesus Christ for your salvation. Look at, John, uh, look at Numbers chapter 21. Now keep your hand at John 3. Keep your hand at John 3. We're going to immediately go there. But go to Numbers 21 now. Go to Numbers chapter 21. The annoying thing about these Calvinists, you notice, is that they give very rational, logical arguments. But that's the thing. The Lord uses that to deliberately make them become fools, stumbling in their own wisdom. That's why the Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. The Bible says the wisdom of men you can make you can stumble upon and God will make you look at look like a fool. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Perfect example of Catholic apologists today, including people like Judas White and Matt Slick. Slick is a bad last name. It shows how slick he is. Tricky, tricky people. And then all these guys got questions. Uh, gotquestions.org, C-A-R-M.com. Those guys are Calvinists, you got to realize. Those guys are Calvinists. When you type in a question and want a Bible answer, you usually bump into those two websites. Now look at Numbers chapter 21, verse 8. Here's the thing. Christ's death is typified to Moses' brazen serpent. Now, notice right here that Moses' brazen serpent was made for everyone. But it cannot operate its salvation unless it's applied. Look at Numbers chapter 21 and verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that who? Everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Look at verse 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came up to pass that if a, a serpent had bitten, bitten who? Any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Look at that. It's made for everyone, but it cannot operate until you what? They saw it. See? Until they applied it to themselves. That's the same thing with Christ's sacrifice. Look at John 3, verse 14, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, remember that? Moses raised that serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So, Jesus Christ, just like the serpent on the pole, is made for everyone who is bitten by a serpent. But look at this. It has to be applied. Verse 15. That who? Is it limited? No. Any man, whosoever, see, any man, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting eternal life. See, it's made for everybody, but for everybody, see, it's made for everybody, yet they have to apply it to themselves. That's the answer. Now, we're going to look at 
Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 again. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I mean, let's wrap up all this argument right here. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 7. So even though these verses are used by Calvinists to prove their point, we see three points so far. Uh, three points. We're, so far is two. The first point we realized is that we saw 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we also saw John chapter 3. That it does make sense. It does make sense that Christ's sacrifice is for the whole world, but it can't operate until you apply. We also saw, second point, Moses' serpent on a pole. So Numbers 21. We saw that this is for everybody, and Christ's sacrifice is an imitation of that in John 3. And now let's do the third point right here. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Now, before I read this verse, here's the third point of the argument. This is more easier, this is more easy than you think. So pay attention. This is more easy than you think. Calvinists mistake that universal atonement to be unconditional. That's where they're wrong. We believe universal atonement to be conditional. See that? That's why their argument seems to make sense because they think it's unconditional. When Jesus Christ made that atonement, it was unconditional. It unconditionally saved everybody, redeemed everybody, all like that. No, that's not what the Bible's saying. The Bible says Jesus' atonement was for everybody to save and redeem, but it's based on a condition. Now you realize it was like, oh, a duh statement. <laughs> if you realize that, see, that's what Calvinists do, evolutionist scientists do. What they do is that they give this, fill it up, fill it up with logic, rationalization, all over the place where you're missing the common sense point. That's what evolutionists, atheists, Calvinists, I realize do. That's what cults do. They make you lose the common sense thinking and they put you down a rabbit hole of all this logic, arguments, explanation, and proofs in scripture, scripture, and you're like, oh, it does seem to make sense, and you avoid the common sense right here. The common sense, which we didn't have, look, I could have just done this one verse, I could have just gave that one argument, and we would have been done with this video. <laughs> all you have to think is this, it's not unconditional, it's conditional, then you're done. <laughs> The ridiculous, look at Hebrews 7, 25. James White's verse, right? Oh, you're saying he's interceding for the damned in hell. No, it's based on a condition, fool. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. That what? Come unto God by him. See that? It saves to the uttermost based on the condition Based on the condition, you come to Jesus Christ. I mean, look at that. Of course we believe his atonement practically saves everybody, redeems and atones, reconciles and all that. But it's based on a condition. It's conditional. All right, let's also look at 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 15. Remember this verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15? Oh, he already saved the whole world. But look at this. It's based on a condition. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came, past tense, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Right? But look at this. Even though he came to save the world, it's going to be based on the condition of receiving. Look at John 1. Look at John 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This will be our final verse, and let's close it for the night. John chapter 1 and verse 11. John chapter 1 and verse 11. So we saw 1 Timothy 1 and John 1. The simple argument, folks, if you don't want to go through all this conundrum, is simply this. It's not unconditional. See, if the Calvinists said the word unconditional, you would have caught it.
but they just never mention the word unconditional because it'd be a dead giveaway. They just have to say, well, past tense, it's already saved. Past tense, uh, intercession, and all that kind of stuff. See that? This is a key. Look at John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So look at this. Remember, Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Remember? All right? So he came for the whole world. But look at this. Even though he came for the whole world, there's a group that did not receive it in verse 11. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. Yes, we believe in John chapter 1, verse 11 through 12, and 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Christ came to save the world. But notice there can be a group who can reject that and a group who can receive it. That thing is based on condition. Condition. We believe in universal atonement. It does save, intercedes, all that. But based on a condition. Based on a condition.